find us. There is nothing, O oh Lord God, that is stronger than you. Satan himself, he, he has to be obedient to you. He's not equal to you. There's nothing that is. You are the one, O oh God, that, that gives us freedom. Christ said that when he makes us free, we are free indeed. And we don't know freedom until we know Christ. And then it's the skies are bluer, the, the birds sound sweeter. Uh, our steps have a, a lightness to them, oh God, because the chains have been broken. And Satan can't do anything about it. That's why he, he bugs us so much. That's why he tempts us. That's why he tries to torment us. Because he knows he's lost. But we have one in Christ. And as aggravating as this world can be at times, we know how it's going to end. There is victory. There is power. There is the release of chains in the name of Jesus. Oh, that we may walk in the Spirit. Oh, that we may learn, oh God, that blessed Blessed is the life in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the family that's gathered this morning. We thank you for answered prayer. We thank you, O oh Lord God, for the trials you have brought us through and you have taught us through. Thank you, O oh Lord God, that nothing, absolutely nothing that has happened in our life this week, whether good or aggravating, has diminished the power of Jesus Christ. You are still Lord. And we acknowledge that this morning. Now, as we open your word, Make it real to us. Help me get out of the way and, and you do all you want to do. Change whatever you want to change. Speak to us however you want to speak to us because, Lord, we are here to worship you. To you be the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated, family. Don't, don't, you, don't you love having family, but isn't it aggravating whenever they come visit? Now, now, some of you are going, oh, that's not nice. No, but it's true. <laughs> right? Because uh, uh, no matter what, there's, there's things we've got to do. I mean, you know, we... we uh, and, and, and even if they are family, it, 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 I do know how to work this. Just in case, or some of you wondering. And you know what the aggravating thing of all this is? The worst? I mean, it's, it's one thing to clean up for family and friends when they come visit. But do you know next week you're going to have to do it all again? Why even do it? Why? why, why? Next week, there's going to be junk on the table. There's... There's going to be trash on the floor that you've tracked in. So why don't we just leave it? Absolutely. Let them stay where they came from. Right? We don't leave it because there's a standard that we have in our minds for our home. We don't leave it because we have decided this is how we want to live. And, and for those of you that the children have moved out and they haven't come back yet, <clears throat> for those of you the children have moved out, you're in charge of your own home. Isn't that an amazing thing? You're not picking up toys and you're not picking up trash and you're not cleaning bedrooms and you're not doing laundry and you're doing it for you. It isn't that wow, and and you, you know what, the vacuum runs a little sweeter because you're not going. Why didn't she pick up that stuff, or why didn't he pick up that stuff, or why didn't you? You're not doing that anymore. Life is sweet. Go with me to First John chapter one. Life is sweet because then we decide if we want to leave the dishes dirty, we leave the dishes dirty. 
If we want to clean the dishes, we clean the dishes. And it's all according to the standard that we have decided to live by. It's all according to what we have decided on the inside of our lives that we want the house to look like, what we want to live with. Uh, if you get up, make your bed, you're excited about that. If you get up, don't make your bed, you're excited about that. You know, God has a standard that he wants you and I to live by too. Just like you and I within our own home and within the yard and with everything, we, we decide this is how we want to live. God decided ages ago how he wants his children to live. And did you know it's got to be aggravating for God just like it's aggravating for you and I with little children? You just pick things up and here they are out again. You just put up the cereal and guess what? I remember whenever Chad was a teenager and boys, if you have teenage boys, you can't fill them up on food. You know, I, I mean, they're a bottomless pit. And I remember that Chad had uh, these chips that he had gotten. And he was watching a movie and Tammy and I were getting ready to go to bed. And, and, and we said, just, you know, don't stay up too late. Just go to sleep, all that kind of stuff. And he goes into the kitchen, and I come back out of the bedroom for water. And he's been in the kitchen, and he's got a bag of chips that he has opened, okay. plus a brand-new bag. Okay. <laughs> and he's sitting in the chair with a movie on, and I said, Chad, what are you doing? Oh, I, I was hungry. I wanted a snack. I said, I said, what are you doing with the bag that's not open yet? Oh, I know I'm going to be hungry whenever I get done with this bag. <laughs> I remember the first time that he went on a date. Okay? Took her to Pizza Hut. All right? Talked the boy well. <laughs> Absolutely cheap date. Came home, and this is what he said. Did you have a good time on the date? Yeah, but I'm not dating anymore. Well, he changed his mind on that. I, I said, why aren't you dating anymore? It costs too much, Dad. Do you know what I spent on that pizza? Right? You see, we've all come up with this standard. Is dating more important than saving your money? Right? Is one bag of chips okay, or you know you're going to need another one? The, the problem with our lives as Christians is that the world has tried to bleed over into what God says is our standard. And for many of us, we have allowed that. We have allowed the second bag of chips, just in case this bag doesn't work out. Of all the people, of all the disciples that understood the love of Jesus Christ, I, I think it's John. In his gospel, he writes and he says, speaking of the disciple that Jesus loved, and he's writing about himself. He understood that Christ loved him. He understood the love of Christ. He, he was with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. He went further with him into the garden. On the cross, Jesus looks at John and and tells him to take Mary, Jesus' mother, home to be his mom, to watch over her, to help her, to protect her. And so when John begins to write, our ears ought to perk up. Because look what he begins to say years after the resurrection, years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. He says in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, <clears throat> This is the message we have heard from him, <clears throat> excuse me, and declared to you. God is light. We could put a period there. But he didn't. Because he wants to clarify. God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. Did you get that? Let's understand. God is light. There's not even a speck of sin or darkness 
in him. It, 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 it's like going to the house, and even though you clean and clean and clean and clean and clean, I hate to tell you, there's still dirt. I mean, come, wake up in the morning, there's dust on the cabinets you just cleaned the day before. All them little figurines, <laughs> dust collectors. John says, there's something I want to teach to you, and I want to give you this message that you need to understand. And the most foundational thing you and I can understand about God is that God is pure. He is holy. He is light. There is no darkness. There is no sin at all with an almighty God. Nothing. Nothing. God doesn't even have bad thoughts. And we can't understand that because we have a finite mind and all we know is what we've been around. All we know is what we have absorbed. But John makes it clear. And John ought to know because he's the disciple that Jesus loved. He's the one that leaned on him there in the upper room at the Last Supper. John says there's this message. Get it. Get it. Understand it. Put it in your mind. Just, just nail it down. God is light. There's not a bit of darkness in him. But he doesn't stop. Verse 6. <clears throat> if we claim to have fellowship with him, with God, and yet walk in the darkness, you are a liar. That's the bow paraphrase. You are a liar and you ain't saying nothing that's true. That's what he says. He says, if we claim to have Fellowship with him. You know what fellowship is? See, for, for most of us church people, fellowship is sitting down and eating together. Right? We're going to have a fellowship dinner. We want you to bring food. Of course. We're going to have fellowship after the service. That doesn't mean we stand around talking to each other. That means somebody brought some cupcakes or something. No. My dad used to say this. Fellowships... Fellowship is two guys in a ship. <laughs> now think about this. If you're in a rowboat, you're out in the middle of the ocean, and it's just you and one other person, it's fellowship. You're going to get intimate with each other. You're going to talk about anything and everything just to keep you aware of what's going on around you. Fellowship is being connected understanding the other person what's on their heart what's on their if I may use the word agenda where they want life to be he says listen if you and I are connected to God and that doesn't mean just on Sunday morning or just on Wednesday night that means that if you and I are consistently and constantly walking together with God talking with God understanding his plan and again, I don't like using this word in a spiritual sense, but understanding God's agenda for my life and for our lives. If I am walking with him and I understand what God wants to do, I can't be walking in sin. I can't be. I, I, I can't be. Because if I am walking in sin, I can't be walking in light. If I am walking, hiding things from God, I can't be walking in pure fellowship. And if I say that I am, then John says, I'm nothing but a big fat liar. How many liars do we have in our churches on Sundays? You know, man, the world calls us hypocrites. John calls us liars. If somebody were to call us liar to our face today, we'd want to fight. You know, but John delivers the punch and says, if you're walking in darkness and saying that you're walking with God in fellowship, you're a liar. You're, you're a liar. And then he goes on to even drive it even deeper. There, there ain't no truth in you. It's not that you're telling a little white lie. But you just you, you're just telling it all. You are liar, liar, pants on fire. But look what he says in verse 7. But, but, let's flip the coin. But 
If we walk in the light as he, as God is in the light, we have fellowship. Check this out. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us, cleanses us from how much sin? All sin. I like that. I, I like that because... I don't like sin. And yet, it's just us and the Lord this morning. I don't like sin. I don't, I don't like the dirtiness of it. I don't, I, it just, but man, it happens. I fail, I fall, I, I stumble. Let's go back to what we talked about last week. Benchmark. All right? A benchmark. There's got to be a benchmark in our life, just like there's a benchmark for, for surveying, and there's a benchmark if you're a teacher. You, you take these tests early on, and then you take the test in the middle of the year and the test at the end of the year, and you set a benchmark, a, a beginning place, and understanding where your students are in your classroom. Benchmark is this. Benchmark is a standard by which something is evaluated or measured. God has a benchmark by which I am evaluated, by which my life is measured. And the benchmark is not me. The benchmark is not Billy Graham. The benchmark is not Mother Teresa. The benchmark is his son, Jesus Christ, his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. I am not going to be measured. My life is not going to be measured by any of you, and your life is not going to be measured by me. Whenever I stand before Jesus Christ and I stand before the Father, I am not going to be asked, well, how did you do according to Yolanda? God's not going to say, how did your life measure up to Billy Graham's life? He's not. He's going to, I believe that whenever I stand before Almighty God, he's going to say, what did you do with my son, Jesus? What did you do with Jesus? See, if, if I've received him into my life, then I have an advocate with the Father, a go-between. If I haven't, I'm on my own. And so a benchmark is what my life is going to be evaluated, what it's going to be measured from now here's a problem and and if you're a carpenter you understand this and you have to be so careful about it that one of the problems that we end up in carpentry is this you can cut a template and you can cut that first two by four and you can cut it 48 inches long and you know it's 48 inches long and that's what 20 more have to be as long as you use that same template to measure every board you're going to be right on there. You're going to be good. But the problem is, if you start using the other boards you cut for a template, by the time you get done, you're going to end up with boards 40 inches. Because little by little, you're cutting off that line and you keep getting shorter. See, that's what we tried to do. We tried to measure ourselves by other people, and little by little, we've moved away from who Christ is. And he says, no, don't measure the template of your life is my son, Jesus, who is the Christ. He is the template. If you want to be measured, that's who be measured by. You say, Pastor, I thought you said that we were getting ready to talk about politics. We are, but we got to get this right. Because who you vote for is not as important as what you vote for. I don't care if you vote for Hillary, if you vote for, for Trump. I don't care if you vote for Johnson. I, I, what matters is, what are you voting for? As a Christian, what are you voting for? It could be Donald Duck running. We'd probably be just as good off, you know? Or Goofy. I like Goofy. That'd be pretty good, you know? <laughs> but the problem is, it's not these people running. The problem is the morality of the nation that you and I now live in what are we going to vote for? Look at this verse here on your outline. Look at the verse in Proverbs 14, 34. Godliness, righteousness makes a nation great. What makes a nation great? Godliness. 
Do you want to know why we have lived in such a great nation? It's because we were founded on godly principles. That's why. We were founded on godly principles. The beginning of our colleges, universities were Christian. We learned in the schools to read by the Bible. That's why God has blessed us. That's why God has blessed us. We were one nation under God. That's it. That's why we were blessed. Not because George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, all those guys were, were super great guys. Praise God, they took a stand and said, this is what we're going to live by. This is what the nation will be founded on. Godliness. Godliness exalts a nation. It does. Godliness exalts a church, too. And the writer of Proverbs says, let's understand some things here. It's not the power of your army. It's not how many chariots you have. It's none of that. What is going to exalt the nation that you dwell in is the righteousness of following Almighty God. You say, but Pastor Stephen, what do you do whenever you have ungodly leaders? You pray for them. The greatest thing you can pray for our president is not that he signed such and such a bill, but that he, she, they get their hearts right with Jesus Christ. You don't like your senator? Pray for him. Instead of talking about him, pray for him. If you spend as much time praying for him as you talk about him, maybe something would be happening. Just a thought. Just a thought. Look what God has done. Look at there on your, your outline in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Because I want you to see God's plan for nations. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Moses is speaking to the Israelites. And, and he says, I want you to understand what God has done for you. I, I want you to understand that God has decided in his infinite wisdom and in his desires to choose you as a nation and above all the people on this planet, you have been chosen as a people to be God's possession. Did you get that? If you read the book of Romans and get into the book of Romans, then what you're going to understand is the spiritual sense of being the children of God has now been transferred to you and I as we have faith in Jesus Christ. Now you and I have become that spiritual nation possession of Almighty God. Okay? Do you know, and, and, and let's understand this, do you know that everybody in Lehi Acres are not children of God. They're not. Now they're God's creation, but they're not God's children. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. What love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. In other words, John does not say what love the Father has lavished on the entire population of this earth. What love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 6 like God was speaking to us today. Look what it says. For you, grace, church, for you are a holy people, not a perfect people, but a holy people, in other words, we're separated unto God. We are to be God's possession. We are to be separated unto God, which brings us back to we are not to be walking in the darkness. We are to be walking in the light. 
Because we're holy. Did you know you are a saint? If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a saint. Now, you may not act like a saint, but you're a saint. Why? Because you are God's child. How dare you trash other Christians? For you're trashing God's child. How dare you trash your wife or your husband or whomever it may be, you're trashing God's child. You know what that would make me aggravated if you were trashing my child? How do you think it makes the father feel? If I came up and said to Yolanda, and I always pick on her because she loves me and she lets me get away with it, and I start talking trash about Yolanda, which I'm not going to do because I love her, but if I start talking, what do you think our father feels? I'm talking trash about my sister. I'm talking trash about his daughter. I'm talking trash about his possession. For you are a holy people. And look, two. It tells us not only are we separated, but it tells us who we are separated to. If you're married, then you should be separated to. The person you're married to. Maybe I need to clarify that. Okay. For you are a holy people to the Lord and the Lord capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, Jehovah. For you are a holy people to Jehovah, who is your God. Jehovah, your God, has chosen you. <laughs> Have you ever been at school? And I know some of you people, Chris and, and Stephen back there, these boys were probably chosen first whenever they were playing ball. Right? I mean, they, these are big boys. I want Chris on my team. I want Stephen on my team. I was one of the last ones. Y'all ever been there? You ever been there? You know? I was one of the last ones. I was in junior high, played football. Running back. All 98 pounds of me. You know what? The reason I got play running back because I could run. I learned to run. <laughs> Them big boys get after me. I'm running. Look what the Bible says. Jehovah God, the Father, the Creator, the Creator who could have chosen anyone, anything that He would desire, He chose us to be His. Uh, y'all just sit right there and be okay with it. Y'all must have been chosen first. But people like me, whoa, I got chosen. I got, I, I get to cross over on his team. You know, yeah, the first draft, I'm there. That's it. Look what he says. You have been chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of this earth. You talk trash about me all you want. I belong to God. He chose me. He picked me. He chose me. He picked me. Why in the world would he pick me? I mean, he is God. And, and he does know who I am and what I am, and he still picked me? He picked me because he loves me. He knew before I knew. He knew I was trash. He did. He knew I was a liar. You know, he knew I was sinful. And God said, I still love you, boy. I love you. I want to make you mine. 
I want to make you mine. Look with me there on your outline. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Jesus, he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Why did Christ come to earth? He loves us. He, he, he gave himself. And, and, and the reality is this. I couldn't die for your sins. I can't even die for my own sins. I can't die for my own sins. I can't die for my wife's. I can't die for my children's. I can't die for our sins. That's why the son of the living God, he came down pure, faultless, full of light in him is no darkness at all. And he clothed himself in human flesh and he gave him. He gave him. I do not believe. I do not believe that the Roman soldiers nailed him to the cross. I believe he lay there willingly for them to nail him. I think he willingly stretched his hands out because he loves me that much. And look what Paul writes to this young preacher, Titus. He writes him and he says, Christ gave himself for us. There's not a lot of people that will give themselves for you. There's not a lot of people that will give themselves for you. Whenever you get in trouble in school, most of your friends are, you know? When you're growing up with a bunch of kids in your family, <laughs> who made this mess? <laughs> right? I mean, we're backing up. Not me, Daddy. Not me. Christ willingly laid down his life for us because his desire was to make us belong to him. Amen. Yes, sir. Woo! Let's talk about something very dear to my heart. 64 Mustang. <laughs> 64 Mustang. Or whatever your car is, whatever it may be, you go down and you look at that thing and you just, the saliva begins to, to roll. You wipe it off. And you go into the manager's office and you sign this contract that I'm going to pay for that thing. If it takes me the rest of my life, I'm going to pay for that thing. Right? And you do that in faith, believing that you will be able to pay the full price for that vehicle. How many people are willing to do that for your life? Not to sign a contract on a car. Very few friends will do that. But to sign a contract saying, I will give my life for you. That's how much Christ loves us. That's how much he loves us. That he was willing to leave heaven and to walk the dirty, dusty, this world that you and I dwell in, and to give his life. Paul writes Titus, this young pastor, and he says, check this out, Titus. Tell the people this, Titus, that what God's son Jesus did was that he gave his life for you and for your congregation because he wants to make you his. Oh, man, what God has done for us. There's a picture of a priest during the New Testament times. 
And the picture of priest is, is shows the, on the left-hand side is the scribe who would write and copy down the, uh, God's word and make copies of it because they didn't have computers. So it was a manual copying down to make copies of God's word. On the right-hand side is the priest that's carrying the Torah, the law, and he would be there. The one in the middle is the high priest. What they did, and understand there was a difference in the Old Testament between the prophet and the priest. The, the prophets in the Old Testament brought God's word to the people. Samuel walks in a village and they're afraid. Because what has God said? What have we done wrong that he sent Samuel to tell us? Right? Nathan approaches David, King David, and says, there's a man that had one sheep. And he goes through to tell David, this is what you've done wrong before God. Now, that's what the prophets did. Jeremiah, go through and just talk about all the Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel. They told what God says here. Now, the priest in the Old Testament, this is what the priest did. The priest would bring the people before God for forgiveness of their sins. The prophet declared, thus saith the Lord, get it right. The priest said, okay, you want to get it right? Now let me show you. Bring the sacrifice. Let's sacrifice it before God. Let me enter on your behalf to the holy and the high priest to the holy of holies on your behalf. Okay? Check this out. Look there on your outline of 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter says that we're not like the world anymore. We're not living in darkness, but you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. We've been picked. You're a chosen people. You are royal priest. You know what that means? It doesn't mean we're all preachers. What it means, though, is that you're a priest if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're a priest. You're not the high priest. There's only one high priest, and his name is Jesus. But you're a priest. You're a priest. Did you get that? You're a priest. What was the duty of the priest? To bring people into the presence of God. To seek forgiveness for these people's sins as they bring them before God. See, to, man, we're going to be here for a while if we get into this. <laughs> too, too many of us, whenever we talk to somebody, we want to thump them with God's word. That's not your job. Your job as a priest is to share the truth with them. Let God's spirit thump them because you can't save nobody. This is what God says. I want to bring you to God so that you can receive his forgiveness like I've received his forgiveness. You are a priest. You say, but pastor, shouldn't you tell them they're done wrong? Share God's word, but I can't tell you you've done wrong. Only God's word and God's spirit could tell you you've done wrong. I share this. Look what God says. Now, how does that apply to your life? I'm in the business of bringing you to Christ. You can't clean a fish until you get it in the boat. Think about that. Too many of us try to clean the fish while it's still in the water. Until you come to know Jesus Christ, you'll never get your act together. Never. Because it's not from the outside we change, it's from the inside to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that changes us. So as a priest, I just usher you before God. Here's what God says. This is how your, your life aligns with God. Get it right with God. And, and look what Peter says. You are royal priest, a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. As a result, you could show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful life. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, woo, 
glory, now you receive God's mercy. Uh, some of you, oh, who cares? <laughs> Look what he says. If you catch this, this will change the way you live this week. If you catch this, it will change the way you have family this week. Once we were living in darkness. You remember what John said about darkness? If you're walking in darkness, you can't have fellowship with the light. You can't do it. If you say you are, you a liar, liar, pants on fire. That's it. And Peter picks up and says, once you were there, but what God has done, it is God that has done it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. You hadn't done a thing but receive it. He says, now, God has brought you in and the purpose of God bringing you into his possession is now for you to be a priest. A priest. A priest. All right? He has brought you from the darkness into the light. And the purpose of doing that is so that you, you may show people living in darkness what it's like to live in the light. And God has done that because he had mercy on you. You know, I, 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 being Southern, I grew up with people saying, Lord, have mercy. Right? God had mercy. If not, you and I would either be in hell today or we'd be on the way. One or the other. But because of God's great mercy. If somebody gave you, let's say my buddy Chris, because we all know he's loaded. <laughs> let's say my buddy Chris down here, he bought you a million dollar penthouse. Down on Naples Beach. And Chris, yeah. <laughs> Go, Chris. <laughs> well, I pray you better slip out. <laughs> yeah. And he buys you a really nice penthouse. I mean, this thing is beauty must. A million dollars. And he says, I want to give it to you. And you say, Chris, why? You know, I really love you. I really love you. Man, you really love me. You know? Some of us, some of us, that place would be trashed within a month. First of all, because it didn't cost us anything. Secondly, because we're used to living that way. And thirdly, because... I just don't feel like picking things up. And Chris would come back after a month just to see if we're enjoying the place. And he'd ring the doorbell and, and we'd open the door and Chris would walk in and it would stink to high heaven because we haven't taken the garbage out. There is, there is pizza from three weeks ago still sitting on the counter. It's growing something. I don't know what it is, but it's growing something. How would that make Chris feel? I'd be aggravated. I spent my money for you because I love you, because I, I want to be kind to you, because I, I, I think you're a great person. I, I spent that, and this is the way you treat my kindness? This is the way you treat my love? Do you know what this cost me? Do you understand the extent of what I have done to give this to you? And now you treat my favor like it's trash? You treat what I have done for you, what I have given to you, what I have purchased for you like it means nothing? We do that to our Father. 
we become more worried. And, and please hear my heart on this. And we're getting ready to close. We become more worried in an election year of who gets elected than what they stand for. We become more concerned, are they Democrats? Are they Republicans? Are they Libertarians? Are they Socialist? And we get more concerned over, well, I'm not going to have no woman in the White House. Why does Trump want the White House? He got billions of dollars. Instead of being concerned of where our nation has gotten to and where this country is going and the policies and the procedures that are thrown at us every day. Listen to this. Listen to this. And if this doesn't light your heart on fire for the gospel of Christ, I don't know what will. Approximately one-third of the entire population of the United States one third of our population currently has a sexual transmitted disease. That's from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. One third of the people in the United States. Do you know what that means? That's, that, 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 uh. I hate to go to a bathroom in a public place. I'm, I'm just being honest. One third. Every single year, there are 20 million new, new STD cases. Every year. You ready? Parents, you need to hear this one. As of June of 2016, one out of every four teenage girls in the U.S. has at least one sexually transmitted disease. One out of every four. Did you hear that? Thirty percent, one-third of all Internet traffic now goes to adult websites. 70% of all the men in America in the ages of 18 to 24, they visit at least one adult website each month. And website, adult, I'm not talking about Bass Pro Shop. Okay? It has been estimated by the law officials that 89% of all pornography is produced in the United States. Are we a godly nation? We're not. We're not. The number of American babies killed by abortion each year if, is roughly equal to, and this is each year, the number of American babies killed by abortion each year is roughly equal to the number of U.S. military deaths that have occurred in all the wars that we have been in. Why did Christ die for us? It is to make us his own possession and that you and I might be the priest of Lehigh Acres in southwest Florida crying out, be you reconciled to God. We will not, we will not see our economy get better. We will not see uh, the riots and the racial problems. We will not see the sexually transmitted diseases. We will not see any of this get better unless and until there is a spiritual revival in the United States. No man, no woman is going to change the tide. Now, before we leave here, I want to tell you. If you are one of these statistics that I just gave, 
I want you to know that Jesus Christ is still Lord. And I want you to know that nothing you have ever had happen in your life, nothing, no matter how bad you think it is, no matter how horrible you may think it is, nothing is greater than the forgiveness of Almighty God. And I want you to understand that if you are one of these people, God loves you. God loves you. I don't condemn you. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. God loves you. God gave his son for you. And his love wants you to come into his family so that you can tell your story of the goodness and the graciousness and the love of Almighty God. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to be a statistic. He wants you to be a child. That's what he wants. We sang a little while ago. There's power in the name of Jesus. He breaks every chain. I don't care if it's alcohol. I don't care if it's drugs. I don't care if it's sex. I don't, no matter what it may be, his power breaks every chain that may have you bound this morning. I'm not perfect. I am in no way close to being perfect. But I am forgiven. He has broken the chains in my life. He has broken my chains. And I give him the honor and the glory for that. Whatever I am that's good is because of him. Whatever I am that's bad is because of me. He loves you, child of God. And you and I have got to be on our knees praying for this election. You and I have got to be on our faces before God praying, Oh, God, revive America again. Revive America again, oh, God. Only he can do it. Let's pray. With your heads bowed, we're getting ready to pray. I want you to think about what I said. I, I used Chris as an example. You know, it'd be wild for someone to give you a penthouse worth a million dollars. That would just blow your mind. But what's even greater than that? God has given you his kingdom. Not just a penthouse. He has given you his heavenly kingdom for your possession, for your inheritance. That's how much he loves you. Some of us this morning have been living in God's gift and just trashing it. And we need to ask him for forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Some of us have lived like pigs in a mansion. We know that we have asked for forgiveness. We know that we have asked Christ to come and be Savior and Lord of our lives, but we have lived the opposite. And this morning, if you were to look into our spiritual houses, you would see how we have trashed this possession. And we come to you and we ask you, oh God, forgive us. We are so ashamed. If somebody were to look inside of our lives, Lord, they would be just astounded. Because we look so good on Sundays. I am so thankful that you tell us that if we confess our sins to you. If we tell you, God, we know these are sins. We, we know what we've done is wrong. We know what we're doing now is wrong. And we tell you, God, we agree with you that it's wrong. That you forgive us of our sins. And not only that, but you, you wipe it away like it never happened. You break those chains and you remove them from our lives. They're gone. So, Father, there are some of us here this morning asking, and, and we ask that you would hear our hearts, not just the words that we, we mumble, but, Lord, our hearts' confession. There are some of us, God, that 
We've been trying to live in this new vessel the way that you'd want us to live, but we falter and we fail and we, we look at our lives and we wonder why you would choose us. But this morning, we want to thank you that we are now daughters and sons of the King. We are now princesses and prince because of what Christ has done for us. And we thank you that you forgive us. And today we are going to live in the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ and what he has done for us by purchasing forgiveness, by purchasing freedom, by giving us a new life. For we are not our own anymore. We were bought with a price and we are to live unto you as your possession. We are priests. We are a holy nation set aside not for the world, not for a 64 Mustang, not for a nice house. We are to live according to the, the guidelines you have given to us because we belong to you. We belong to you. We are yours. Our home life is yours. Our work life is yours. Our singing is yours. It's all yours. The money we have, the money we don't have is yours. It's all yours. The clothes we have on belong to you. We are yours. We've been bought. We are your children. God, may we walk in the light as you are in the light. May we make choices that would glorify the King. May we not walk in darkness. May we refuse. May we turn our back on it. May we get rid of that junk at home that tempts us to walk in darkness. For we are children of the light. Born into a newness in Jesus Christ. Maybe where you're seated right there. Right now you want to talk to the Lord and just say, hey, that's me, God. I want to walk in light, not in darkness. I want to have fellowship. And I know this morning the only way I can do that is to leave some of my darkness behind because it's been pulling on me. I'm running to the light. I am running to the light, oh God. I am running to the light. Father, thank you for hearing our heart. Thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for being here, oh God. It's not me, it's not us, it is you. It is all you. And even now as we worship you through our offering and our tithe, we worship you, oh God, through our giving. To you be the glory of this offering. To you be the honor of this offering. To you, O oh Lord God, be glorified. And we pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.